Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of Duke Energy, Jim Rogers. Thank you all very much. I have the privilege today to introduce U.S. Commerce Secretary Gary Locke. Secretary Locke's story is distinctly American. His father, born in China, was a small business owner operating a grocery store where he worked while attending Seattle's public schools. Secretary Locke's work ethic and determination took him to the governor's office in Washington State and later to the post of U.S. Commerce Secretary. He is the first Chinese American to hold that office. Secretary Locke's story embodies the bold future orientation that we have highlighted here today. As governor of Washington, he pushed the boundaries and broke trade barriers around the world for the sole purpose of advancing American products. During his eight years as governor, his state gained 280,000 jobs. He also has a very deep appreciation for the innovative technological advances that we've discussed here today and are so important to the future of our country. It is our collective honor to welcome him to today's Powering the People Conference. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary Gary Locke. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for the introduction, and uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here at the Edison Institute uh, uh, Conference, Powering the People. I know that uh, I'm kind of the end of the program, so I'm keeping you away from maybe a reception and refreshments uh, or just headed home, so I'll try to keep my remarks uh, brief. But uh, I really want to thank uh, the Edison Electric Institute for really hosting this forum as well. Because when I met with some of your leaders and representatives uh, several months ago, I said we really need to, to have a dialogue with the regulators and all the stakeholders uh, in terms of the, the power of technology and the smart grid and, and everything else that's happening. And we need to really move forward uh, on uh, these, uh, these goals and these uh, projects. Um, and uh, uh, because the way that America uses energy and where we get it from certainly has been a, a subject of uh, spirited debate these last several years. And that's not going to change anytime soon. Uh, but today I'd like to really tell you a little bit about how the administration is working toward a long-term end goal that I think we can all agree on. And that is providing more clean and affordable energy to American consumers. And here's how uh, the administration is trying to help address this challenge, both in terms of electricity generation and distribution. First, we've been working to make cleaner sources of energy uh, more economical and practical. Uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, uh, the Recovery Act, uh, invested more than $80 billion in generation renewable energy sources, expanding manufacturing for clean energy technology, advancing vehicle and fuel technologies, and building a bigger, better, and smarter electric grid. These investments are funding renewable energy projects and will add some nearly 10 gigawatts of new renewable energy capacity. And they're also helping to develop new sustainable jobs. At the Commerce Department, we've been working to improve our services to support renewable energy. Uh, just this past January, we signed an agreement with the Department of Energy to improve ocean and climate observations, modeling, and forecasting. Because this information is crucial for utilities seeking to find the best renewable energy solutions to fit the needs of their jurisdictions and their customers. Uh, the Obama administration has also helped to push forward the construction of new nuclear power plants for the first time in decades. Last year, for example, the Energy Department announced a conditional commitment for a loan uh, guarantee to help construct twin nuclear reactors in Georgia. And the Energy Department is also working with sponsors of several other nuclear projects and is seeking additional nuclear loan authority uh, from the Congress. Of course, support of clean energy sources is only half the battle. So second, we've got to efficiently deliver this energy 
uh, to businesses and consumers who need it. And that's why the administration has made it a priority to develop a national smart electric grid. The American utility industry is obviously the biggest stakeholder in this effort, with the potential benefits of a smart electric grid well known to everyone in this room. If adopted nationwide, the smart grid could reduce power demand by more than 20 percent, sufficient enough to eliminate the need to run hundreds of power plants during peak hours or simply to delay the construction of new power plants. Many utilities are already benefiting from the operational improvements enabled by smart grid technology. But the real potential is in what it can do for consumers. The smart grid can cons give consumers unprecedented control over how they use electricity. And with the old grid, you know, consumers got the bill once a month telling them how much energy they used over the past 30 days, and yeah, they could compare it with the comparable period the year before. But with the smart grid, consumers can actually look at their computer or their dashboard on the wall to see exactly how much energy they're using in real time. Or consumers can take advantage of perhaps variable pricing, running their washing machine at 3 o'clock in the morning when electricity might be the cheapest. And over time, a smart grid will become the foundation for an energy network where electricity is generated by a wide menu of sources and where some customers consume energy while others are returning it back into the grid. Designing, building, and installing smart grid technology can also be a major job creator. Consider that the $11 billion in the Recovery Act, uh, smart grid, uh, that in uh, the Recovery Act, we had some $11 billion uh, that uh, were uh, projected to directly create some 43,000 jobs and support another 61,000 in the private sector. Another 30,000 jobs will come from a smart grid workforce program backed by some $100 million in Department of Energy funding, as well as an additional $95 million from community colleges, universities, utilities, and manufacturers. The program will fund some 54 smart grid workforce training programs across America to prepare the next generation of utility and electrical manufacturing workers. Meanwhile, to ensure that America's smart grid industry is globally competitive, Commerce's International Trade Administration is working with partners all around the world to promote U.S. products and services in markets where smart grid investment is ramping up. So the smart grid is a clear win-win for both our economy and our environment. The potential uh, from uh, adopting a smart grid is immense. But so are the challenges. And there is the difficulty of ensuring that the array of smart grid hardware and software is compatible, a challenge that our Commerce Department's National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, is working with industry to solve. NIST has collected input from some 600 organizations and 1,600 individual members, some of which I think are in this audience today. And NIST recently rolled out our, rolled out our version 1.0 of the interoperability framework, which identified, prioritized, and addressed new requirements for smart grid interoperability and security. This was done with unprecedented speed. NIST has developed in just 18 months the type of rigorous standards that really took the telecom industry nearly five years to develop. And these initiatives are a start, and many more standards and protocols need to be developed. But it's critical that we get it right, and not just domestically, but also internationally. If smart grid standards develop in a piecemeal fashion from one country or one region of the world to another, we may not easily benefit from the innovations developed someplace else, or they may not be able to develop or benefit from the innovations developed here. A technologies developed today could be rendered obsolete as countries with large market potential or with manufacturing clout later develop their own inconsistent standards. That balkanization will render a lot of our technology and our products and services uh, unaffordable or obsolete. So it's incumbent upon all those who are engaged in developing U.S. smart grid standards to also be actively engaged on the international scene. 
We want to ensure that the technology and the products that we develop or developed with other countries can be sold not just within the United States, but indeed all around the world. Establishing common standards for smart grid technologies is an attainable goal, and we're going to have to keep working hard to achieve it. But finally, even if we solve that challenge, utilities are still burdened by a set of local, state, and even federal regulations that were designed almost a century ago to meet very different priorities. Jim Rogers has talked often and eloquently about this. In the 1930s, the major energy challenge facing the United States was supplying energy to all its people. And regulations were put in place to incentivize energy production and energy accessibility. Mission accomplished. We have achieved universal coverage in the United States. But today, we aren't just concerned about the availability of energy. We're also now concerned about where it comes from and just how efficiently it is distributed. It's no longer acceptable for us to be losing two-thirds of the primary energy between the power plant and the consumer's plug. And whereas the goal in the 1930s was universal coverage, the goal today must, be, must now be energy efficiency and clean energy. But in too many areas of the country, Utilities are financially rewarded only for cranking out more power. In other words, if a utility wants to build a new power plant to meet increased demand, it's allowed to pass on the cost to the ratepayers for the construction and the maintenance of the plant, as well as a reasonable rate of return. But if the utility can meet that uh, same added demand by efficiency measures, be it weatheriz weatherization, retrofitting buildings, or deploying smart meters, they have to eat much of the cost. So if you're, a, if you're a utility with a choice between profitably building a new power plant or investing in efficiency that, only, that, that not only won't be profitable, but might cost you money as your customers use less power, it's really no choice at all. The power plant is going to get built. Of course, the picture is rarely this black and white. Some utility commissions have put efficiency measures like the smart grid on almost an equal footing with new power generation when they're making rate uh, base uh, decisions. Others offer little or no incentive for efficiency. And there are plenty of gradations in between. There isn't a one size fits all solution, not when utilities in different regions have different ownership structures and different embedded costs. And not when consumers in different regions of the country have such different perceptions of the benefits and the drawbacks of smart grid technology. But the fact is, the full potential of the smart grid will not be unlocked unless there are incentives for utilities or consumers to be rewarded for better efficiency. Smart grid technology to allow the customer to program that electric clothes dryer at 3 o'clock in the morning or even to sell electricity back from their electric vehicle into the grid at 6 p.m. will all be for naught unless utilities are authorized to charge different rates during the day or even to simply to uh, recoup their investment for uh, measures of efficiency. I remember my experiences as governor uh, in the 2000-2001 energy crisis uh, and uh, we were urging all of our consumers to save electricity. And in fact, uh, so one of our uh, uh, investor-owned utilities uh, had already deployed smart meters. And so p consumers and ratepayers were able to go on their computer, go on the internet, and see their actual use by day, by hour. And they offered some incentives for ratepayers and customers to cut back on electricity, but not sufficiently. The incentives weren't there because of the regulations imposed by regulatory authorities, and we did not have enough time to get the legislation passed to enable them uh, to change those incentives and to have those incentives put in place. So we really need to involve the, the, the rate payers as well as the utility regulators and the utilities. To grapple with these regulatory challenges, the White House has a National Science and Technology Council that was created. Uh, and they have a, a smart grid panel of experts co-chaired by representatives from NIST and the Department of Energy. 
And the panel is working closely with state regulators and other stakeholders to overcome the range of technical, economic, regulatory, and sociological hurdles to smart grid adoption. The utility industry will ultimately be the lead in smart grid development. But the federal government can help to make targeted investments in areas of smart grid development that are too risky or too expensive for the private sector, to help convene stakeholders to set technical standards for our smart grid development, and where appropriate to work with local bodies to help develop incentives that will, that will encourage utilities to invest in smart grid technologies. Meanwhile, utilities need to be involved every step of the way, and they have to take the lead in educating consumers on the value of the smart grid technology. And if we get this right, all of us will have an almost unprecedented opportunity to change how we use electricity, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and to create good new jobs in this emerging industry. As smart grid technology standards and policy discussions move ahead in the next year and the years ahead, I really look forward to hearing of your progress and how we overcome the challenges that, out, that are out there, historic challenges, but incredible opportunities to transform the way in which we use electricity in this country. Keep up the great work, and thank you very much.